Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. <clears throat> and I'm going to be going over the um, kind of shorter eight-gamer that we've got here on Wednesday. We do have a five-game uh, kind of early slate that's starting here in a couple hours. Not going to be going over that. We do have projections for that loaded to the site for um, uh, both mine and sheets are are loaded. Um so check out uh, whichever ones you prefer. And of course, as always, we do have uh, main slate projections loaded as well. So um, here today, we got some goofy pricing going on. I mean, we'll, we'll get into it, I guess, when we get to these games. But we got some weird shenanigans going on with DK over here. Um, yeah, some performance-based pricing, I think, but... Uh, I mean, I don't know. We've got we got some some kind of goofy stuff going on here. Um, ownership wise, we're really sort of filtering to a couple of of key spots. Uh, notably, Nestor Cortez. He is one of the goofy pricing spots. He's eighty one hundred here. It's uh probably the lowest price tag we've seen on him in quite some time. Um, got an elevated ownership figure coming to Sandy Alcantara at Coors Field. I mostly kind of agree with that. Um, but we've got a, a Wrigley anti-win game, as it were, here with Marcus Stroman and Kodai Sanga, who got pushed back from yesterday's start to today. Um, and a lot of ownership coming to these guys, because he got about a 15-mile-an-hour win coming in from center and left center. Um and naturally, we have uh, Bryce Miller, who is making his fifth start in the big leagues. Uh, he is 10-1 now, the most expensive arm of the day. He gets Oakland, whose matchup's fine. Um, but, you know, he's 10-1 now. Uh, in any case, let's uh, let's just get into the games here, and we'll try and keep this a little bit condensed as uh, we do only have the eight games. So let's just uh, get after it. Um, first game here is Baltimore, New York. Tyler Wells on the mound, he's kind of, I mean, inappropriately priced as well. Now, I love the arsenal here and the changes and the, and the growth that Tyler Wells is making. I've always thought that it was in the tank for Tyler Wells. And so far this season, really spread out here in the arsenal, very balanced, sequencing very well, and really starting to come into his own here. Um, so naturally, the price on him is going to continue to drift upward. However, I think we got some shenanigans going on in the underlying metrics. Uh, he's throwing a lot of pitches here, right? So that's not really a problem. He's going deep into games, six and two thirds nearly in every start this season. Um, all that's excellent, right? 168 average allowed, a little sus, pretty low. But the expected batting average allowed just at 223. So not a whole lot of regression coming there necessarily. He's got an 080 whip, which is a pretty damn good number, I would say. 5% walk rate, which is great. 62% strike one rate, which is great. 12% swing strike rate, which is great. Called strikes a little, little down at 15%, but a 27% CSW is not a bad figure. Uh, where I'm a little suspicious here is notably the strand rate. This is eight, 89% is insanely high. Um, and that is not a sustainable number. So when we put all of this together, he's got some barrels here at a full 11%. He's got some swing and miss, yeah, to both sides of the plate, 23.5%, basically to both sides here. But he's a heavy, heavy fly ball pitcher, given up mid-30s percentage wise in in hard contact categories that translates with so many fly balls to some baseballs over the wall here average exit velo over 90 miles an hour that's notable for sure but it's mostly the barrel rate and the strand rate that are the figures that should really jump out at us um you know once again the arsenal is is fantastic and the results have been pretty damn good all season but He's got an ERA of three with expected metrics floating about a run, run and a half higher. Combine that with a very high strand rate, super low whip that is not sustainable long term. 
right? A an average with an XBA looking for about six ticks in regression, right? And, uh, a WOBA looking for about five, six ticks in regression. And the ISO also looking, or allowed ISO, looking for about four to five ticks in regression. So given the hard contact woes and the pretty suspect homer per nine numbers, given this mega high fly ball rate, I think we got some regression coming for Tyler Wells here a little bit, even though he's been very good and I I really like the changes coming. I mean, too many fly balls and too much hard contact in the air at Yankee Stadium this is a bad recipe, man. Um, and I think, I think we might be able to get to some Yankee stacks kind of off the board here a little bit today. They're expensive, right? And they're hard to get to tonight. Glaber at 51. I really hate paying over 5K for Glaber, but uh, he's leading off. I mean, there's not a lot you can do. He, he really didn't strike out all that much. So, um, yeah, let's let's go after it. 38% hard contact to the right side of the plate for Tyler Wells here. I think this is an attackable spot for... I mean, Glaber's going to be totally off the board here. Um, Aaron Judge, I really like this spot for him. He's still just 6,200. Hit another bomb last night to tie the game late. I think this is a fantastic play here today. Uh, Judge, will, he'll get some ownership, as he really always does. But the rest of the Yankees, they're going to be totally ignored. 51 for Rizzo kind of sucks here. But um, the, the regression is going to come to both sides of the plate for Tyler Wells here. And as of right now, he's he's still giving up a full 193 ISO to the to the lefties here. He's not going to walk them. So, he'll pitch to a little bit more contact and Rizzo will have uh, a little bit more upside than he does usually because he he walks so much. Uh DJ at a very playable 37, Bader 38 still playable. I like Willie Calhoun here. Uh but who knows what the hell the Yankees are going to do in the outfield. Uh they got total circus going on over there um he's 2500 is calhoun so i like that play a lot if he's in there in like the six or the something something like that uh volpe is is fine at 4100 he's a young hitter though um but he'll profile pretty decently he'll strike out a little bit in this particular matchup but he's got enough pop to mix in at shortstop if you would like to go there uh, i think the yankees are a very intriguing stack here tonight uh targeting some some pretty suspect underlying metrics here for Tyler Wells. Uh, even though the results have been very good and very encouraging this year uh, for for Tyler, I I think the price tag is a, little, a bit too high given you know the uh, the underlying metrics here. So would like to get to the Yankees next. Nestor on the other side, 8100. Well, he's flat underpriced. Um, but let's let's kind of dig into this a little bit. Is he underpriced? Well, the results are are telling us that that's an absolute no. He's been pretty terrible all season. Um, it, it's taken him a little while to get going here. He was dealing with, like, what, a shoulder or a hamstring or something? I don't know. I can't keep it straight uh, with all these pitcher injuries. But um, he's been struggling a little bit to, to really kind of get off the schneid and get back into sort of Nestor mode battling the mechanics a little bit and four of his last five starts have been uh well they left quite a bit on the table to say the least um he didn't crack 14 dk points until his last start against toronto when he finally went a full six innings that was the what just the third time this season that he went a full six innings he struck out six did give up two runs still uh but the the depth and and the strikeout stuff was you know finally showed up against a, a pretty good offense. So perhaps starting to figure it out a little bit. Still at a very playable price tag, of course, here at 8100. But 40 percent ownership? Are we kidding here? Um, he's just not getting the swing and miss really to both sides of the plate. Yeah, 24 percent, a tick above average or whatever. But um, really not seeing like he doesn't have a, a raw out pitch to the right side of the plate. Right, not throwing a change up a lot, you're not gonna want to throw a slider a whole hell of a lot to opposite handed hitters unless you're burying it back foot. Nestor doesn't really do that a lot. And so far here in the early going, not getting any value out of the slider as it is. Right? Not getting swing and miss to the left side either. Cutter is not a swing and miss pitch, right? This is more of a soft contact and ground ball pitch to opposite handed hitters. So he's really relying on 
just his four-seamer to get all the whiffs here. And he's only throwing 91-93. So that's really what's leading to all of the power to the left side here. 35% hard contact number, sub-14% soft contact. 20% line drives, a lot of fly balls here in 40 full innings against right-handers this season. 033 ground ball to fly ball with some elevated hard contact. It's translating into some power. 269 average allowed to the righties, 346 Woba, both elevated figures with a realized 205 ISO. Now in aggregate, just a 175 X ISO to both sides. Lower expected batting average and a lower X Woba, but that's because he's his numbers against lefties so far. He's only seen 30 hitters. Let's not really take a lot out of, out of this, but um, that's dragging those numbers back down to a respectable aggregate range. But there's a significant weakness here against righties, and it's because he doesn't have an out pitch against the right side of the plate. And at 40% ownership with this kind of fly ball rate and this kind of hard contact rate. Uh, against the right side of the play, I don't want to deal with this at Yankee Stadium against a very, very good offense. We saw what they did to Garrett Cole last night. We talked about that. When we pay very high price tags for guys, we take a lot of risk. And when we pay very high ownership figures with guys, we take a lot of risk. I think there's some susceptibility here for Nestor. Now, there is there there's some positive regression coming for him? Yeah, probably. I mean, he's a better arm than this. He's got to figure out an out pitch, though to the right side of the plate. Otherwise, these numbers are going to stay high. Um, we got to expect that the slider value is going to come up against lefties. This swing and miss rate, he's only got, what, like I said, 32 hitters faced against lefties this season, and he's got 7 Ks. It's not like this is a bad number or anything like that. So this will drag up as the sample grows the strikeout rate when he gets a little bit more, uh, gets a few more lefties under the belt. That's fine. And, and the strikeout rate and whiff stuff to the right side is okay so far. But this is probably going to come down if he can't figure out a whiff pitch. He needs a strikeout pitch against the right side. Otherwise, the, the hard contact and the fly balls are going to persist. And that's a bad respite. He's also throwing at Yankee Stadium tonight, right? And this is, a, like I said, very good offense. Against lefties, look at these numbers. 120 WRC+, plus, one of the highest numbers in baseball. 11% walk rate, 20% aggregate K rate, 182 ISO with a neutral ground ball to fly ball here with a 20% line drive rate, 345 Woba against lefties for the O's. This is a dangerous spot here for Nestor. I'm not sure I want to eat north of 40% ownership of the guy despite being pretty underpriced. I'm not sure he is totally underpriced here. Swinging strike rate is just average 10%. He's got a 25% CSW. Yeah, strand rate, probably a little low, but the whip is still fine because he's not walking people. He's just pitching to contact, full 80% here to pretty to, to both sides of the plate, and most of it's really to the right side. So he's throwing strikes. That's great. Is he probably going to you know, be more expensive than this go in the future? Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, but I don't know. Until he figures it out and tells me that, He's he's got a whiff pitch against the right side of the plate. I don't want to go near him at this ownership figure. I don't care if the projection is high. Um, I think this is a very dangerous spot, and I think the Orioles are very much in play as well. I'd like to get to some Ryan Mountcastle here tonight. 4,600, I think that's very playable. Anthony Santander from the right side, I like this play a lot at 4,300 also. Austin Hayes, very playable. James Buchan behind the plate, you can play him, 2,300. Plenty of righties over here. Georgie Mateo still expensive at 49. He's kind of off the table there, down at the bottom of the lineup at that price tag. But uh, Rutsch, you can play at 5,000. This is a far play more playable spot than it was yesterday against Garrett Cole. And as I mentioned, they, they took him apart pretty good. We finally fought, saw that stinker from Garrett Cole. So um, I think you can go after Nestor and get a lot of leverage on the field here. I think his ownership is too high. We'll see how it develops through the rest of the day. But, um, you know, this price tag is mostly driving this ownership figure here. I, I think this is really out of whack. Uh, I would like to get to offense here in this game. I know they're not projecting very high in the betting markets or any of that kind of shenanigans. Because uh, there's still two very good arms here, don't get me wrong. But I think this is a, a good tournament spot for both of these guys. Like, you can't play these dudes in cash, I don't think. Um, maybe some Baltimore in cash. This is a very good offense against left-handed pitching here. I think his ownership is way out of whack here for Nestor. 
Okay, San Diego and Washington. We're going to see a lot of ownership come to the Padres here tonight. Not so much on Ryan Weathers. 7,000 for him on the mound. Uh, he gets Washington, and I'd like to probably get to some Washington stacks because Ryan Weathers didn't strike anybody out. He's got a walk rate and a K rate within 30% of each other, and that ain't good. 15% aggregate strikeout rate with a 10% walk rate. Uh, 59% strike one. That is not excellent. Certainly when you're not throwing it past people deeper into count. He's only got a 23% O swing rate. That's not good. 8.5% swing strike rate. That's not good. A lot of called strikes here from the changeup in the slider. Stays on the edges a little bit here with the four-seamer, which is encouraging. But uh, overall, he's very hard to play in DFS because he doesn't strike anybody out. And you need that against the Nationals because in aggregate, against lefties this year, 560 PAs, 118 WRC plus for them. These guys create against left-handed pitching, 17% strikeout rate. This is a super difficult number to get through with somebody that's not going to throw it past you. Uh, not going to hit for hard contact and, and power necessarily, but they will circle the base paths. They got a, a bunch of guys with a lot of speed that hit left-handed pitching very well. So I think you can get to some contrarian national stacks here. They're still very cheap and popping exceptionally hard in value. It, it's not so much in, in raw projection numbers that the nationals are going to pop. It's because they're so cheap. And pretty much every every one of them is under 4100. 4100 is the most expensive, and that's Lane Thomas, and he's leading off. So yeah, go ahead. He hits lefties great. Um, we'll see what they want to do at second base. They might play like an Ildemaro Vargas or something instead of Luis Garcia. Well, like Garcia in the two hole at 37, he's okay in stacks as well. Joey Manessa still 3000. This is a fantastic spot for him, I think. Very warm in Washington tonight. Uh, Jamer from the right side, he's been okay this season, 32. That's playable. Not my favorite at third base necessarily, but Stone Garrett's great at 2,800. A lot of pop and upside there. Speed as well. Kabert behind the plate, he doesn't strike out at all. You play Alex Call or C.J. Abrams. Or it, all of these guys have plenty of upside in this particular matchup against Ryan Weathers. And since we're going to see so much ownership come to the Padres on the other side, you can stack the game because it's a fantastic spot for them as well. Targeting Trevor Williams, he's overpriced here at 7,200. I think he should be 5,200 in this particular matchup. He doesn't strike out anybody either. He throws a hell of a lot of strikes and pitches to an 85% contact. With both of these guys north of 80% contact rates, there's going to be some baseballs flying around tonight. And I have a hunch that uh, you could see some baseballs fly over the wall too. Here's Trevor Williams here, 177 ISO to lefties, 234 ISO to righties so far this season, with a 237 aggregate X ISO to both sides. 268 XBA with a 348 X Woba. These are high, high numbers and very attackable, certainly. Um, are they attackable enough that warrants paying 61 for Tatis, 51 for Bogarts, 58 now for Juan Soto? Yeah, maybe not. But you can still play them because they're exceptionally high upside. Soto is very clearly heating up. And he's been great over the last couple of weeks. Tatis is Tatis. Plenty of speed and power upside there as well. Jake Cronenworth. This is a very good batted ball matchup for him. Uh, hits the baseball on the line. And kind of on the ground here. A little bit of ground ball lean for Cronenworth. And batted ball-wise, that matches up pretty decently to get the baseball on the line against Trevor Williams. Now, he's been very serviceable this season, not so much in DFS, but it, in terms of real-life results. It's because he's inducing so much cough, soft contact to both sides of the plate. A full 20% here is a very, very encouraging number for him, despite the fact that he's not eking value out of his historically very good changeup. No value on the pitches so far, but he's got five of them, and he sequences well. So that's how what's really keeping him out of far more trouble than he would be in otherwise, given this outrageously high barrel rate at a full 13%. He's kind of hard to stack against because he's not walking anybody and he's thrown so many strikes. But a 13% barrel rate is very attackable. Sub 30% hard contact rate is good. So the combination of the soft contact and lower-ish hard contact rates make him serviceable. So he's survived, but this is a very bad matchup for him against what looks to be an offense kind of heating up. I mentioned yesterday that they've just been terrible, and sure enough, they got to uh, Mackenzie Gore last night. Uh, this is a far better batted ball matchup against Trevor Williams, of course. So hopefully we're going to start to see the Padres heat up a little bit, but 
undoubtedly paying 58, 61, and 51 for Soto, Tatis, and Bogarts, respectively, is not easy to do. So you're going to need some value. And that's why I think you can just stack the game here if you want and go to some Nationals pieces on the other side. You're going to If you get to the Padres, they're going to be second in ownership definitely today to probably Miami later on, uh, who we'll get to later on. Um, so you're going to have to balance that, but it's, it's not like this is a bad spot or anything. You can mix in cheaper pieces, of course, and get to some of these other guys like a Ruggie Odor. Uh, he's 2,600. This is a okay spot for him, even though he, he's terrible. Same with Craig. Dr- uh, let me try that again. Same with Trent Grisham. Um, at 2,700, he's also terrible, but uh, it's a playable spot for him since Trevor Williams not going to throw it past him. It's okay to get to these cheaper pieces. Hassan Kim is, I like this play, uh, a pretty decent bid at 3,300. He's second and third base eligible. You can play him if you don't want to play Ruggie. That's fine. Matt Carpenter at 29, playable piece as well. So you can make Padres stacks happen uh, for sure, but you know, be aware that you're not going to be the only one doing it. They're going to be very popular today, pushing 12 15% in ownership here in early runs. So you just got to balance that. I'd much rather get to the, the Nationals on the other side. They're far cheaper, and they allow you to do a hell of a lot more stuff and get more contrarian both on the mound and in the batter's box with your – your other players. So um, I think I probably favor the Nationals, not in a fundamental spot or anything like that, but due to uh, ownership concerns, I'd probably favor them. I really like Joey Manessis here, 3,000. This is a damn good play, I think. Um, I don't want to play Ryan Weathers, and I'm certainly not playing Trevor Williams. Like I said, I think both of these guys are, are pretty overpriced. So offense really only here, but I think we can see the baseball fly tonight. Okay. Dodgers and the Braves. I think we might be able to see the baseball fly a little bit here tonight, too, but probably not from who you'd expect. I want to play the Dodgers. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe you would expect that. I don't really want to play the Braves. I kind of want to play Tony Gonsolin. 8,500 on the mound for him. I think this projection is gotten a little carried away, too. The downside's pretty low, I think. Uh, it, nobody's going to be playing him, and I don't think that is necessarily warranted. The, the numbers on Gonsolin here are, are pretty stunted, I would say, so far in the early going. Um, he's got mid-20s strikeout rates, and really to both sides of the plate, not this season, because he started late. Um, but I'm encouraged by the increase in the pitch count over his last several starts and the production. The raw results have been pretty encouraging. Over the last three, he had a bad, two bad matchups against St. Louis and San Diego in his last two starts. Went just five innings, but the strikeout stuff was there against San Diego. Struck out six in the five, and the surpre- he hasn't given up an earned run in his last three starts. And we're getting him at 8,500. We were paying north of 10K for this guy all of last season. And now that he's kind of getting into the swing of things here, I think it's a very playable spot. We also could have played uh, Bobby Miller last night. We saw that he performed very well also. Tony Gonsolin has strikeout stuff. He's got a very balanced four-pitch mix, even though he's not, you know, we're not showing value on it or anything uh, necessarily so far in the short sample. But all of it's very, very good. He's got a killer split. And this is where he gets most of his swing and miss. He throws it a lot, excuse me, 30% this season. And he throws it uh, a lot to both sides of the plate. So I think we can go after some strikeouts and target some upside here for Tony Gonsolin on the mound. 8,500, I think he's underpriced. Um, and he's not as, maybe he's not as underpriced as some of these, as these other guys may appear. But, we, I mean, we only got to deal with 6% ownership on the guy here. Um, it's a, a bad matchup. And when I talk up a pitcher against the Braves, it's usually when they get blown apart and Braves make me look stupid. But... Gonsolin is a very respectable arm here. I think the projected run total for Atlanta at a full five runs has gotten a little carried away here. Um, I don't want to play them really at all. They're very expensive. Yeah, you play Acuna. I mean, play him every day. It doesn't matter. He's 64, though. Matt Olson, 53. Murphy back up to 53. And Austin Riley at 49 still. Ozzie Albee's 47. I don't know what we're doing here with, with all these guys. They have not been all that excellent in the last whatever, a couple weeks or so. I don't think these price tags are warranted in this particular matchup. Now, nobody's going to be playing them. They're off the board, certainly. You'll see 
whatever, 5% ownership on them. And you can always play the, the Braves, don't get me wrong. They have the upside to get there. But against right-handed pitching, they're a below-average offense, 97 WRC. I'd rather play the Nationals, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're far cheaper, and they get a better matchup, and they create more. Um, obviously, it's not a direct comparison, but you get what I'm, I'm saying here. 174 ISO, they'll hit for some power and hard contact, but we're not terribly worried about that with Tony Gonsolin. 10% walk rate, also not worried about that with Gonsolin either. He has the strikeout stuff in mid-20s, as I mentioned, and that's what we want to attack with the Braves against right-handed pitching. They're not great. They hit a lot of ground balls and not so much on a line here. So it's medium and medium plus and hard contact here, but a lot of it's on the ground. And as I've mentioned the last few days here, the only guy creating runs for them, moving on the base paths, is Ronald Acuna. Every other one of these dudes is is just hitting the ball over the wall or rolling balls over and grounding out. So um, they have upside, of course. You can always play them in tournaments, but I'd rather side with Tony Gonsolin here and play him in the mound. I like this a little bit. I think he's underpriced. And I really like the ownership, mostly. Um, Bryce Elder on the mound, I think he's overpriced here. I don't want to deal with this. Uh, 9600 I want to play the Dodgers quite a bit. Um, now, they're very expensive as well, but this is still probably the best off, raw offense in baseball. They're really starting to come into their own. J.D. Martinez, having come off the DL uh, with the back issues, has hit Jackson uh, three in, in the last two days, I think. Um He's really starting to heat up. Freddie Freeman has had a, a good series down here in Atlanta against his old team. Mookie is Mookie. Will Smith doesn't strike out. Max Muncie's Max Muncie. All these guys have plenty of upside. David Peralta has been pretty damn good hitting the ball in the air a lot more. Now he's over here with the Dodgers, and they told and they taught him how to hit the baseball in the air. Uh, he's 2,400. You can mix him in in stacks because it's very difficult to get to a full Mookie Freeman, Will Smith, Muncie, J.D., stack here because every one of them is 5,000. Mookie's 58. JD's 47. You know, so hard to get there. So you're going to have to make some um, some pivots down to some cheaper pieces if you do play the Dodgers. David Peralta, he'll be in the middle of the lineup. Uh, I think that's a very good play. Jason Hayward has also had a pretty decent series as well. They might keep him in the lineup swinging a pretty decent bat so far this year. That's okay also. Um you do have the, the cheaper middle infield pieces, Biggie Vargas, Mickey Rojas, that you probably are not super thrilled about playing. Those are right-handed, and Bryce Elder gets a boatload of ground balls against the right side. Sinker-slider change combination, change mostly to the lefties. Uh, but the sinker-slider keeps him really far down on the strike. So you want fly ball hitters, and that's what the Dodgers are here. Uh, pretty much every one of those guys I mentioned is hitting the baseball either on a line or in the air in aggregate over their last, like, 750 PAs. So I want to play the Dodgers. Um, I'm pretty bullish on them here tonight. It's also warm in Atlanta, and baseball flies down here when the when it's warm. So I've always got pop-up storms and whatever to worry about in Atlanta, but uh, so keep an eye out for that. But I, I, like some, I like some Dodgers here, really kind of off of the Braves. I think Bryce Elder's overpriced. I do love the ground ball rate, but, like, we talked about – susceptibility in very high hard contact rates, even if the ground ball rate is very high. 50% hard contact. I, I don't care if, like, you've got a 4 to 1 ground ball to fly ball ratio. That's going to come down. Um, but 50% hard contact is still attackable because he's got a north of 20% line drive rate to both sides of the plate, 21 and a half in aggregate. We're going to see... The Dodgers, I, I think, hit for some average here. 272 XBA with a 332 X Woba, 152 X ISO against Bryce Elder here. Uh, I think we've got some some upside for Bryce Elder to, to see some regression. He's also got a super high strand rate, 85% here. I don't think this is necessarily sustainable long term, even though he does get a lot of ground balls. I think the ground ball rate to the right side in particular has probably gotten a little carried away. There's only one starting pitcher in baseball that's been able to sustain this, and that's for Amber Valdez over a very large sample. We don't have that kind of sample yet for Bryce Elder. Um, will he be able to do that? Maybe. But um, I don't think we're quite there yet. And this is the best offense in baseball I, outside of Tampa. Uh, I, I want to play them tonight and target a very high price tag and some regression. I, I think the projection numbers 
for Bryce Elder here are far more in line with where they should be compared to Tony Gonsolin, for example. I think he's underpriced and underprojected here so far. Okay, Mets and Chicago. We have uh, Wrigley win, but it's, uh, as I mentioned, sort of inverted. Um, blowing in here tonight at about a 15-mile-an-hour clip. Kodai Sango we talked about yesterday. He's got the walk problem, 14% here. And unfortunately, we could have played him yesterday because we had so many other arms to get to. Today, we're seeing 40% ownership in the guy, and I'm off I'm off, off the train. His price did decrease from where he was yesterday. He's 92 from the 94. Um, and this is a fine spot, don't get me wrong, but I'm not eating 40% ownership on a guy that has a 15% walk rate. It's just not happening. So I'm going to take the same approach that I do uh, with Blake Snell and Dylan Cease. I just don't eat ownership on the guy with this high a walk rate. It I, He's only going to go five, five and a third here. It, maybe he strikes out 12 again. Uh, it's very possible with sub-60 degree weather and, and a 15 mile an hour wind blowing in. He's got a high ground ball rate. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, he could make me look dumb. Great. I, I want him to make me look dumb because I want to play the guy. But I am not doing it at 40% ownership with a 14% walker. It's just not happening. Um, they, you know, I, I like the arsenal and I like the potential for the guy. But it, it just I can't do it at this ownership figure. It's too high for me. Uh, Marcus Stroman on the other side, I'd much rather play him. But I'm not sure I really want to do this either. Like The Mets don't strike out at all. 20% aggregate strikeout rate against righties this season. They don't create. We talked about this yesterday. They're just a bad offense. Um, and they got taken apart, again, by a pretty bad arsenal in a two-pitch guy in Drew Smiley last night. They just don't hit. It, like Pete Alonso is the only guy that, hit, that is hitting for any power in this entire lineup. But... They don't strike out, and that's the worry that we always have with Marcus Stroman. We're eating some ownership on him. It's far more palatable than 40% on Kodai Senga. 8600 is a better price tag, of course, but I think he's a little overpriced here as well because the strikeout stuff is starting to drop off a cliff. We saw it very high in the early part of the season, but it's it's coming back to, to earth here pretty quickly. Um struggling to get ahead of hitters, and he's spraying this a little bit. The walk rate is about double what it's been historically for Marcus Stroman. He stays off the barrel. He's still got a very high ground ball rate. All of that is great, which is why I'm fine eating some ownership on Stroman here tonight, especially when we've got Wrigley Wynn to worry about, or to not worry about, I should say. Um, that's all fine. It, it's really, I'm not jacked about the price tag and the strikeout rate in this particular matchup. None of these guys from the left side of the plate against whom he's exhibiting just an 18% strikeout rate so far, they they don't strike out. You know, Brandon Nimmo, Jeff McNeil, Brett Beatty, Danny Vogelbach, Frankie Lindor. They, they don't strike out against right-handed pitching. Um, and even though they're not going to hit for a lot of power and create all that efficiently, they're still super difficult to go after, and there you end up seeing just like a lot of whatever we saw last night, 5-1 or 5-6-2 games or something like this against the Mets, and I mean, their offense just stinks, and it just makes them hard to go after because they don't strike out. Similar to a lot of the other teams like a Cleveland or a Washington or something. Um, hard to play, but hard to go after too, so I'm not super thrilled about playing a lot of Marcus Stroman. I'm going to have some. I'll probably, I'm much more confident coming in at, you know, with the field here on Marcus Stroman at 20% than with with the field on Kodai Senga. That, that's just not happening. Um, you know, so, I'd like, I'm pretty lukewarm. I don't want to play offense. You know, it's hard to get the baseball in the air here. I don't even want to play Petey tonight who I play pretty much every day. Uh, I don't want to play anybody from the Cubs. I've been playing a good bit of, say, Suzuki. But, I, you know, it's going to be hard to get the baseball in the air against both of these guys, which makes them playable, which is what's spiking their ownership and everything. But I think the ownership on Kodai Senga is, is just too high for my personal liking. I'd rather play Stroman. But his matchup is worse. So, you know, I'm kind of lukewarm on it personally. Um, you know, both of these guys are probably going to pop really hard tonight. But uh, I'm not super jacked about really anything in this game. I kind of hope Kodai Senga walks five people and 
Same thing with Marcus Stroman, you know, just like walks four people, gives up a run or two, and, you know, each of them just strike out five guys in five innings or whatever, you know. So, I don't know, not super interested. Let's move on. Detroit and Kansas City, uh, I'm really not interested in Matt Boyd either. I think you play some off-the-board Royal stacks a little bit. Oh, we talked about this this yesterday. They hit for a lot of hard contact against left-handed pitching, man. 103 WRC+. plus. I'd rather play the Royals at the same sort of offensive aggregate numbers that the Mets exhibit you know, than the Mets, right? Because they make more hard contact. And Matt Boyd is going to give give up more baseballs in the air. Um, and it's also 80 degrees. You don't have to worry about 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing in your face at Wrigley. So I'd rather play the Royals if I had to choose. And, eh, I don't know, the Royals kind of stink, you know? Like, so that doesn't really put me on to Matt Boyd. Uh, he is still only striking out 20% of guys. He's more of a pitcher anymore, throwing a full five here. But... In the shortish sample, he's not going deep enough into games to make this equitable. He's only going an average four two thirds here. This makes it very hard to play him. If we're going to see some positive regression, I think we probably can for Matt Boy. He's got a six flat ERA with expected metrics far lower, a run at least, and a very low strand rate here, 61%. So if we're going to see some regression, that's probably where it's going to come. But he's walking people. Not so much on the barrel. It's going to make him hard to kind of stack against in that regard because he's not giving up a lot of hard contact and barrel contact. But he's giving it up a little bit to righty still. 277, this has always been the problem with Matt Boy. He's been fantastic against the left side, but problems against the right side. And that's because his changeup has never really been all that great. Four seamers where he's given up most of the power historically. And that really hasn't changed, haven't come off of injury and back over to the Tigers. So 277 realized average allowed to the right side, 359 Woba, two pretty damn big numbers. 194 ISO allowed to righties as well with a 1.9 homers per nine. Probably a little noisy there, but 060 ground ball to fly ball here. That's uh, that's attackable without a super equitable um, swing and miss arsenal against opposite handed hitters and the four seamer and the change up. Curveball doesn't really use it enough to get a lot of whiffs down in the strike zone against righties either. It's going to make this, I mean, these numbers are going to stay high. And in aggregate, even with the elite numbers that he's exhibiting in this short 34-hitter sample against lefties, they're still pretty attackable. 246 average, XBA, that is, 322 XWOBA, and a 164 XISER. These are attackable numbers. This is a bad offense over here in the Royals. I'd rather just play the very high upside righties like a Salvi and a Bobby Witt. You could play Eddie Olivares as well. Maybe a Michael Garcia if you mix him in. You can always play Vinny against lefties and righties. You could play MJ as well. He hits lefties okay too. Uh, but they've been leading off Nick Prado against lefties the last few days. I don't know what Quattrara is doing over here, but uh, that's not what he should be doing. Um, so you could play some Royal stacks. They're popping a little bit into betting markets. And, you know, you only got to lay $1. twenty on them right now. I think this is an okay play. The problem is the Royals have Zach Greinke going on the other side. And, yeah, he just gives up production. You know, he gives up three runs every damn start. Uh, they're serviceable starts. But he still gives up some production. And he's always viable to give up a six spot or something. And, and then your bullpen's really just kind of uh, wearing it. And... Trying to hang on by a thread. Uh, that said, I, I love Granky still. I don't like playing him in DFS, of course, but down 5,700, I mean, he's popping for an 11-point median projection here. There's very low variance with Granky usually. Like, he gives it, you know he's going to give up three runs, you know he's going to strike out two guys, and you know he's going to throw about five innings or something like that. Um, and I think that's probably in the same range here again tonight. This is an upside spot for him, though, because the Tigers are bad, right? 23.5% aggregate K rate, 115 ISO, 81 WRC+. plus. Not going to create against Granky, so you might actually see Granky pop for, 50, for a full 15 or even 20 points tonight, and that's that's attainable at 5,700. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going out of my way to play that Granky, but he's 5,700, and the Tigers are awful. Um, he's got so many pitches here, and this offense is so bad that they would swing and miss. You could very well see Granky pop 
for a full K in inning tonight against this this offense over here in the Tigers. They are terrible. So I you know don't tell anybody I said this, but I think I think Zach Greinke is in play a little bit here. Um, he's still incredibly efficient. Doesn't walk anybody and throws strikes. He just pitches to so much contact. Doesn't throw past anybody. So. I think if uh if we're getting down here in this you know sub six six K range, I think Granky is in play. I would much rather play him than Ken Waldachuk, who we'll get to later, for example. Um, so I think at fifty seven, I don't think this is totally horrific, or as horrific as it normally is when you consider playing Granky. So I'm on the Royals here a little bit, and like I said, you only got to lay a buck twenty into betting markets on them. I think that's playable. Um. I think I I think the the spot is attackable here against Matt Boyd, maybe not so much in DFS, but you might be able to get a little bit of value into betting markets. Um, two bad teams here, don't get me wrong. So you could see all kinds of shenanigans go on, but uh, I'm siding mostly with Kansas City here tonight. Okay, Miami and Colorado, um, got to side my, with Miami again. Carl Kaufman is on the mound making his second start. Only went four and a third, and. Struck out, what, I don't know, two or three or whatever it was. Um, let's see. Yeah, it was two. Uh, or maybe it was four. I, I forget. In any, in any case, math is hard. Um, can't really play him, right? He's making his second start, in it, and it's a Coors Field here, and he's a very young arm, super vulnerable, and despite this being the Marlins, they're a very bad offense themselves, and they've disappointed pretty sorely over the last couple of days in terms of terms of expectation um it's still a major league lineup right and they still have some professional hitters here john birdie Luis rise georgie soler at the top of the lineup even garrett cooper hit a bomb last night you know so coors field is going to solve still a lot of problems for some generally low upside hitters and Luis rise i mean he's hard to play he's 5700 now it's because the guy goes two for five every damn night he went over five last night so um you know, he's in a huge, huge slump. John Birdie, though, 4800 This is still a playable price tag because he's got so much speed. He he can walk or, you know, bloop a single or something, and then he's got upside to steal bases. Not stealing as much this season as he did last year, but it's still there for him, and uh, it, it's very much in the tank. But these guys are expensive now, and that will hopefully keep their ownership down. It's not I don't think it's going to, though. They're still pushing 15% in aggregate right now, and I think it's, that's warranted. Uh, price adjusted, the best play is going to be Brian De La Cruz. He's still just at 4,000. Gene Segura, not so much. He just hits so many damn ground balls, but uh, Carl Kaufman probably not going to throw it by him here. Um, so you could get to the Marlins again. You're once again going to have to just balance ownership on them. It's probably just short stacks or one-off pieces that are my favorite. And like I said, price adjusted. Brian De La Cruz definitely in the middle of the line. I've seen the baseball pretty well at 4,000 like that. Um, but the catchers, I don't want to play either Stallings or or Nick Fortes or anything like this. I don't want to play Joey Wendell. He kind of stinks. You know, and I don't want to play Garrett Hampson either. You know, we, we had plenty of sample at at Coors Field with Garrett Hampson. He played like 700 games for the Rockies or, or something. Um, and he was terrible. You know, they, like they had to let him go. So, like, his upside isn't nearly as high. Like, he's in better shape this year, and he's running a little bit more. Um, but if he's going to hit in the nine hole, I mean, it, it's hard to realize a lot of that production. Sometimes you're only going to see three, maybe four at-bats, if a full stack of the Marlins gets there. And it, the Marlins kind of stink, you know? So, um, you know, this is still Coors Field, and this is still an attackable arm. But as we've talked about, like, the Rockies' bullpen has been overall pretty solid, and the Marlins are not the Texas Rangers here. So despite the fact that their bullpen got pieced apart pretty good over the weekend, this past weekend, the Rockies, um, you know, they've, they've been okay, and they've been serviceable, and they've held the Marlins down the last couple of couple of games here in this series. So, uh, yeah, you play the Marlins. Go ahead. Um, you're certainly not playing Carl Kaufman. 8,300 on the mound for Sandy Alcantara. I think you can play this too. I think he's definitely underpriced. Probably see it a little bit of the Cy Young hangover, I think. Not getting as much change-up value or really four-seamer, two-seamer value so far. Uh, but he's still a horse. Still going to throw 100 pitches every start. The strike one rate is still well north of 60%. 
The chase rate is still very, very high at 30%. Swing strike rates are, is, is still there at 14%. The whip is still very good. Strand rate, very low. So he's got a 5-0 ERA, but his expected metrics about a, a full run lower here. So if we're going to see some regression, it's going to come in the strand rate, and that's what's going to drag this realized ERA down. The whip is still excellent, like I said. 27% CSW, this is lower, far lower. It's because he's not getting nearly as many called strikes. But with such a high chase rate, it's okay. We can get away with this. Sandy, historically, of course, he won the Cy Young last year. These numbers were far, far better. So I think he's just seeing a little bit of a hangover. Um, the swing and miss to the right side, in particular, has really kind of evaporated so far with the four-seamer slider combination. It just throws a righty-ready change a little bit. Um, but this two-seamer itself, not really a whiff pitch. And he's only seeing a 20% strikeout rate to the right. This should be, you know, four or five ticks higher than this. Um, so he's... He's okay. I think he's underpriced for his raw upside. He's still going to, like, he has upside for seven innings here because the Rockies' offense is terrible. Uh, we don't want to be dealing with them um, against Sandy Alcantara. This arsenal plays very well at Coors Field. Two-seamer slider change down in the strike zone, and he still has an elite fastball and elite velocity. Um, we'd like to see a little bit more in velo drop-off on the change here. Like to see it a tick higher, but seven percent or seven miles an hour of delta is still very strong. You'd like to see it up to eight or ten somewhere in that range, but seven miles an hour, you know, it's only one tick off of eight, right? So uh, I'm I'm not worried about Sandy here really at all. Uh, I do want to see more swing and miss, but he's still staying down in the strike zone of the righties, so I'm not worried about like outsized production coming to the right side, right? He's still just giving up at 084 ISO here. Expected metrics are all fine. 256 XBA is a little elevated for him, but 319 X Woba is fine, and a 141 X ISO is also fine. We're just missing a little bit of the swing and miss, but with a high swinging strike rate and a high chase rate, that number is going to come up over a larger sample for Sandy as we get deeper into the season here. So not worried about him. I want to play him here a little bit tonight, and at 8300, I think eating a full 20% is kind of aggressive. Um, I think I'd probably rather play Gonsolin if I had to choose between the two because he's not a Coors Field and, you know, he's a quarter of the ownership. But uh, I think Sandy is very much in play here as well. Uh, and he's a fine pivot off of the chalkier guys in the, you know, notably a, a Marcus Stroman or something, even though they're coming in at the relatively the same ownership. Um, so no, none of the Rockies here for me tonight. I don't want to go after Sandy. I really respect this arm. And I like Sandy on the mound. I think you can play him a little bit here tonight. Marlins, of course, but you got to balance ownership. Okay, James Paxton's been very good in his last two starts. He gets the Angels tonight, but I'm still in wait-and-see mode with Paxton. Um, this team is very good against left-handed pitching, and I'm not totally convinced that this is the big maple of five years ago uh, where he's just striking out everybody and not walking people and staying off the barrel and getting ground balls, you know, whole nine yards. He's a fly ball pitcher. Uh, he's really always had kind of a fly ball lean here with the four-seamer slider that he's really relied on. It's a little less so because he's got the change up and the curveball to keep him down in the strike zone as well. In the early going here, heavy, heavy fly ball lean. Um, but we can't really take anything out of this. The strikeouts have been there. They were down a little bit, whatever, in his last start. I'm, I'm not really, um, you know, taking a whole heck of a lot out of just two starts for the guy. What I am taking a lot out of is the increase in the price tag, right? He's up from 77 and 83 in his first two starts, up to 89 here, and he gets a worse matchup. He did have San Diego and St. Louis in his first two, and that was very encouraging um, that he, he got through those lineups, went a full five and six innings in the St. Louis and San Diego starts. So that's good to see. Uh, but I'm, like I said, still in wait-and-see mode with James Paxton, um, and I don't want to go after the Angels with left-handed pitching in general. 115 WRC plus here with a 340 WOBA and a 20% aggregate strikeout rate. Hard contact, mostly coming from, you know, Trout and Otani, but they have plenty of righties over here that make a good bit of hard contact as well. Pretty balanced overall. Some ground balls, yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm okay with this when there's, you know, less soft contact. Um, not popping balls up here, and this is an okay and and fine sort of aggregate batted ball mix here for the Angels against lefties. 
And like I said, if you if you want to play some James Paxton, uh, he's probably okay at 8,900. But if you want to play the Angels too, I think this is fine as well. Um, Trout got into a ball last night, but we saw that Brian Bayo really kind of took them apart. Overall, when this offense goes cold, like they, they go really, really cold. And, um, you know, against left-handers, they're going to do it much less so than they will against right-handers. But... They're still very, they're still very, very um, uh, underwhelming, I should say, um, because when this, like this, uh, is a highly variant offense, um, and if they don't have Trout and Otani going, like these other guys, like they, they go as they go, you know, they go as Trout and Otani go, I should say, um, so it's fine. I think this is an interesting tournament game here. Um, Paxton not garnering a lot of ownership right now. He's not going to get it from me. A low projection for this particular price tag right now. So that's probably why I'm going to end up staying off of it. I want to see more from him before I start playing him in really kind of bad matchups. But as of right now, he's just playing that he's an above average lefty. And this is, you know, an above average team. So it basically makes it kind of an average matchup for me uh, with a little bit of variance because we've only got two starts from Paxton. So not super interested really in offense or Paxton necessarily. I am interested in some Boston offense once again, though, but same thing, man. The, this offense has gone dead cold. Uh, they got picked apart by Griffin Canning last night, and he didn't strike out a lot of guys, but Boston really didn't do anything. Um, there were a couple of walks, a couple soft base hits, and that was pretty much it. Tyler Anderson's going to pitch to... Far more contact, however, than Griffin Canning. He's got a little bit more strikeout stuff, does Canning, than Tyler Anderson. 14% this year. This is down five ticks from last year. He's walking people. He's having trouble getting ahead in counts and and, and throwing strikes later in the count as well. Just a 24, 25% O-swing rate here with just an average 10% swing strike rate. 25% CSW is not great. Um, he's got a 5.0525 ERA with expected metrics even higher than that, with a six and a quarter xFIP. So, um, despite the fact that he's been bad, he probably should be worse. His expected batted ball metrics: 2.63 xBA was getting kind of up there, 3.50 xWOBA definitely up there, and a 1.62 xISO. Not terrible there, but still elevated. Uh, nevertheless, realized. He's given up a 298 average so far to the right. He's 380 Woba and a 236 ISO. Um, he's really getting hit, or hit around hard by the right-handers, despite the fact that he's got a pretty decent change-up. He's inducing a lot of soft contact there with the cutter-change combination, but not getting a lot of value out of those three pitches that he's using the four-seamer cutter-change and not using this two-seamer, thankfully. Otherwise, these numbers would be way worse. So he's okay against lefties, but not so much against righties. Boston definitely better against righties than they are against lefties, but the last mediocre lefty that they saw, they put up a nine spot in the first two innings against Marco Gonzalez. Still very dangerous against left-handed pitching, too. 22% K rate, 10% walk rate, 111 WRC plus with a 168 ISO. This is very attackable still, this arsenal, and the, the batted ball profile for the Boston Red Sox against lefties. So um, I think we can get to some offense there again. Probably short just short stacks, because I'm not jacked about playing or paying 5,900 for Devers and 57 for Yoshida in these particular matchups. Um, you know, in lefty lefty matchups, like you can play them, yeah, go ahead. But they're expensive, man. And yeah, I mean, it's going to keep their ownership down. They're well down the list. But I think it's a very high upside spot yet again for Boston. Probably going to go to them. They're probably going to make me look stupid and, and smash my head in the wall. But. I think this is very attackable once again for Boston, and uh, I I don't want to play Tyler Anderson really at all. I don't think any of the DFS upside is there for him in terms of swing and miss stuff, um, and certainly not in this matchup. So give me Boston, maybe a little bit of Paxton, but I'm like I said, I'm still in wait and see mode. I don't really want to go after this. Maybe some Angels. I think there could be some offense here again, but you know we've seen the last two games there should have been offense here, but. Everybody was just terrible, so who knows. Okay, let's move on to Oakland and Seattle. Last game here. Can't play Ken Waldachuk. I'm still not playing him. Um, now, he's been surviving a little bit, right? But he's given up 
like he's similar to Grinky in terms of consistency. He's given up three runs every start. He's not striking out anybody. Still giving up power. Um, so I can't do this because the numbers are still not coming down. It's every damn start with him that he's giving up pop to right-handers. Still just an 18% strikeout rate with a 13% walk rate. He walks everybody, and he gives up hard contact on the barrel. I can't do it, even at a very cheap price. It needs to be 4300 for me to start to consider this. Um, and even then, I think it's bad. You know, So I, I just can't do it. You can play Seattle, even though they have been atrocious against, against left-handed pitching this season. Super underwhelming. 87 WRC plus with a 26.5% strikeout rate. We're starting to converge here. You know, for with a full season's worth of of, of plate appearances against left-handed pitching, 470 PAs, that's not a small number anymore. Just a 160 ISO, 31%. Like, the line drive rate is very encouraging here at 23%. So I think we can very much attack Ken Waldachuk in that regard, certainly with righties, because he's got a 267 X average, or the XBA that is, a 380 X Woba, and a 244 X ISO. That's to both sides of the plate. Realized to righties is 308, 415, 271. Huge numbers here. Um, he'll induce a little bit of soft, and that's with the changeup and the slider combination that he tries to keep down in the strike zone, but he's still a fly ball pitcher and getting on a barrel here. So you, you can't play him. Are the homer numbers probably going to come down? Yeah, a little bit. Because um, 2.8 in a 34-hitter sample is is nothing but noise. 2.5, though, in a 185-hitter sample is not so noisy. It'll come down, but, I mean, it really hasn't in his, whatever, 15 or 20 starts that he's got in the bigs. These numbers have been this bad ever since he came up against the right side of the plate. So uh, you can play the righties over here, but unfortunately Julio, due to his one good game, is now up to 5,900. So you got to stomach that. That sucks. 4,400 for Gino. That's very playable. Still hits lefties well, even though he stinks elsewhere. Jared Kelnick is a playable piece at 46. Cal Raleigh is okay. We'll see if they play him or um, Tom Murphy behind the plate, but he's 4,800. It's kind of stiff from the right side of the plate for him. So not my favorite full stack to get here uh, with the Mariners tonight, even though they're popping very hard in the in the run total, in the betting markets, whatever. you got to lay $3 on them. Um, that's kind of aggressive. Tay Oscar still is terrible and, and is striking out as much as Joey Gallo. He's 3,900, though, and A.J. Pollock, he's probably got to be the best price-adjusted play at 2,300, along with Josie Caballero at 26. I think it's fine to get to some Mariners because, like I said, Waldachuk's giving it up to everybody, and it's not really changing much. But he's probably still going to survive for about five innings, maybe give up three, four runs, and you might be a little frustrated with some Mariner stacks here tonight if they can't really get off the schneid because they just haven't done it all season, and it's been very frustrating to play them. So um, not my favorite. I'd rather just pivot to some other guys. But Waldachuk is super, super attackable here. And getting a late-night hammer, um, they're getting some pieces, I think is absolutely warranted. Bryce Miller on the mound for them. What are we doing here with 10,100? Like, I get the matchup, and I understand that he's been very equitable in his first four starts, five starts, uh, four. He was great in his first three, right? Not so much as we talked about against Atlanta in his last start. Just struck out four, gave up three runs finally. Um, his walk rate is still elite. Control is still elite, which was really kind of a question for him coming up. And he's still going deep into games. He still went six and a third, despite the fact that he didn't strike anybody out in that start against Atlanta. But I am not paying a full two and a half X price bump on a guy uh, that's got five starts in the big leagues. Now, I love the arm. I love the initial control that he's displaying. I love the arsenal. I'm not paying this kind of price bump this quickly despite this very good matchup. I will have some, but I am not eating a full 30% of my teams on Bryce Miller tonight. I am expecting him to get beat up at some point. And despite the fact that this is not really a major league lineup over here in Oakland, against right, certainly against right-handed pitching, it's still a major league lineup. And this is still a young arm. And there's still variance that hasn't quite reared its head just yet. Now, this could make me look very stupid. Now, I'm going to have some because if he goes out and just tears apart Oakland like he did in his first start again and strikes out 10 in six innings or whatever. I'm going to feel like a jackass for <laughs> for getting so bearish on the kid. But I'm still 
I, I mean, this is very worrisome. Like, he was 4,000, literally not even a month ago. So uh, we want to pay 10-1 and eat 30% on the guy now? I mean, there are plenty of other arms I think we can play here. You do not have to play this. And I'm going to be coming in underweight to this number and starting to take stands. I don't like paying high price tags for pitchers. And we saw it like with Garrett Cole last night. Even Strider gave up three runs or whatever he did, five or four runs or something. Um, you know, there's variance when you start paying this for him and eating ownership at the same time, even against hapless lineups like this. Now, I'm going to have some, of course, you know, don't get me wrong, but uh, we have gotten way out of control here with the price bump on Bryce Miller. Everything is great so far, but it's not going to be this great. Otherwise, like, he is Cy Young, you know what I mean? And and that that is not... Uh, you know, we can't expect this all to persist like this. So um, I, that said, I'll probably just have some Oakland stacks as some coverage because I'm expecting him to get blown apart sooner or later. Um, might not be against Oakland as it you know, definitely didn't materialize against Atlanta, but it's going to happen sooner um, sooner or later. Uh, who knows if it's tonight, but, um, you know, why not take shots against a guy that is – very clearly gone a little bit too far too fast in the in in the price here um now i love the matchup et cetera et cetera there's a, there's all of that yeah fine but um you know i'm gonna have to take a stand eventually <laughs> and uh you know i'm just gonna do it so maybe it burns me maybe it doesn't who knows but that's kind of where i am uh okay so rant aside on some of the pricing shenanigans that we got going on here uh let's get into stacks real quick Baltimore and the Yankees. I want some offense here tonight. I think Tyler Wells is overpriced. I think Tyler, or, uh, Nestor is underpriced, yeah, but really not all that much. Um, certainly for 40% or ownership or whatever he's seeing right now. Yeah, 42? No, thank you. I, I want to get to Baltimore. This is a very good team against left-handed pitching. Nestor, I think, is super susceptible. He needs an out pitch. He doesn't have it. Give me both the Yankees and Baltimore here tonight. No pitching there in outsized exposures for sure. San Diego and Washington offense here, too. Uh, definitely no pitching for me. No strikeouts here. Trevor Williams could suppress a little bit of the Padres because they have been a dreadful offense pretty much all year. Very underwhelming, even though they are starting to heat up a little bit. Uh, you got to pay some real expensive price tags for the Padres tonight, and they're going to be very popular. So similar to the pitching rant that I just went on, uh, same goes for hitters. Uh, there's even more variance with hitters because they only get four ABs every night. Um, so, that said, you can still play the Padres because this is a, undoubtedly a very good spot against Trevor Williams. But I like the Nationals here a good bit, too, as a much cheaper pivot. They'll allow you to get different, uh, and you're going to have to do that because you don't want to just eat so much ownership here today. I would like to get to some Dodgers tonight against Bryce Elder. I think he's overpriced, certainly for this particular matchup, and I think there's regression coming for him. Even though the ground ball rates are very encouraging and very high, Dodgers hit a hell of a lot of fly balls here, and this is still a top two offense in baseball. Uh, give me some Tony Gonsolin as well, targeting Atlanta. Um, it's an av- it's a below average offense over here against right-handed pitching, and, and Tony Gonsolin is a well above average right-handed arm. Mets in Chicago, I don't want any offense here because the weather stinks, but I want to come in underweight on this pitching too. I think it's we've gotten carried away with the Kodai Senga. I, I can't eat 40% ownership on a guy that has a, a 15% walk rate. It's just not happening. I would rather play Marcus Stroman, but he also doesn't have the raw strikeout stuff, and the matchup is worse. So I'm kind of lukewarm on the pitching here, uh, despite the the weather here. I think the ownership has probably gotten a little bit too carried away. Detroit and Kansas City. Yeah, you can play some Royals here. You might be able to play Zach Greinke. Don't tell anybody I said that. Um, no Matt Boyd here for me tonight. I don't like the strikeout stuff, and I think the Royals are, are a little bit sneaky here. No Detroit either. Uh, but you can always play some guys against Granky. I hate stacking against the guy, though. Miami and Colorado. Yeah, Miami, sure. Um, no Colorado for me tonight against Sandy. I want to get to some Sandy. You can always play both teams at Coors Field. Don't get me wrong. But Sandy is a very good arm here. I think there's positive regression coming for him, certainly in the, in this suppression metrics. Boston and the Angels. I want to get to some Boston again. Um even though they've they burnt me the last couple of nights, uh, I want to target Tyler Anderson. It, I, I'm not encouraged at all with what I'm seeing from him so far this year. And Paxton, yeah, you can play a little bit of him because he's been good, but I'm expecting, I'm still in wait and see mode mostly, and I don't like the price bump. I'd rather play some other guys 
like a Tony Gonsolin or a Sandy Alcantara in the same sort of range, for example. But he's coming in at 11%. That's playable. Um, you want to play some Angels? They're very good against left-handed pitching. Go ahead. Oakland, Seattle. Yeah, I'm going to have some Oakland. Uh, I'm probably the only one anywhere that's going to have some Oakland. Um, but I... I think we've gotten a little out of control with the Bryce Miller price tag here. Even though I love the kid, don't get me wrong. Uh, the ownership, I think, is probably a bit too high at, at this particular price tag. Rather, just play other guys. you got 10 guys on the mound that you could play. Um, do you really want to eat that on a on Bryce Miller? Okay, I'm done ranting. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we'll have projections and ownership updates for uh, both the early slate and the main slate, uh, of course, as we always do. So keep an eye out for those throughout the day, and good luck to everybody punting here on this Wednesday 8-Gamer.